there guys, gals, and non-binary pals, GM Potter here, and today we will be going over the Worst Witch series uh, by Jill Murphy, and how it compares and contrasts to the Harry Potter series. This is something that was recommended to me on TikTok, that if you like Harry Potter, but you can't stand the blatant transphobia, racism, and fatphobia, and all the other awfulness that is JK Rowling, um, you should try out the Worst Witch. And like okay and I there's seven books in both series which is interesting um, I thought that was kind of a neat a, a neat little little bit of trivia and then I started reading the books now the first one came out in let's see 1974 is when the first one the worst witch came out they're very short they're very much for elementary school, uh, beginner, they're very much beginner chapter books, which is what Harry Potter starts out as. It's a upper level beginner chapter book is the first one. And then the books get longer and more complex. And she said that it's because the character grows and as, as he grows, she needed more time and more space. And I'm like, eh. And in Harry Potter, I think it's just too long. Like, I think it's just absolutely too long. Like we didn't we could honestly cut some of that um but anyway the worst witch was first published the first book of the first of the series was published in 1974 um and was an immediate success it sold out within two months so this isn't some obscure book that no one has ever heard of she isn't like an indie author this is a book that rolling probably read as a child or as, as a young adult um, there are just too many similarities for me and i was talking with a family member I'm like yeah they're really similar and this and that and it's widely theorized that one ripped off the other and it's easy to say which because one came out in the late 90s the other came out in 1974 um and oh no no it just feels that way because you're an American and well I'm like let me finish reading the books and then I'll let you know and the seven books okay that's a that's a coincidence and it's the Worst Witch feels like Harry Potter told from the point of view of Neville Longbottom because it's the Worst Witch in the Academy and Neville until he his wand is broken and he actually gets spies on because he's using his father's wand and the wand chooses the wizard and all this tragic backstory that doesn't really belong in a children's book. Those are children's books. I know we all read them as adults and loved them and grew up with them, but they're written and mar marketed to a children's audience and they're really not appropriate for children, first of all. Um, Neville's the worst student, and they're broken up and they're color coded, which I'm like, that's interesting. I've never been to a boarding school, but yeah, I guess you could color code them based on the groups you break them up into. That that makes sense. Miss Cackle's Academy, which is the magic school in uh, in the Worst Witch universe, is only five years, and Harry Hogwarts is seven years, so that's that's a difference. Um, although we have the headmistress, because Miss Cackle's Academy is an all-girls school, she feels like a female Dumbledore in a past, in a, how do I put this? Miss Cackle is the jumping off point for what would become Dumbledore, except where Dumbledore engages in child abuse in that he knows Harry is in an abusive home and he chooses to leave him there because of magical protection, which to me is unacceptable. There's never a good excuse to leave a child in an abusive home, especially if you know it's abusive and you know it's going to be abusive putting him in there. There's never an excuse for that. Dumbledore is, up, is absolutely 100% a villain in the piece. That, that's before all of his manipulation and half-truths and little lies and all the rest of that scheming he does. The fact that he leaves Harry in an abusive situation when he could literally, literally any home in the, the Harry Potter universe would be happy to have him. And if he didn't want him to grow up to have a big head and he wanted to stick him with another muggle family, he, he doesn't... <sighs> There are plenty of muggle families, non-magic using families out there that would ha be happy to have a little boy to raise and would treat him well. So there's really no excuse for that. There, there's really not. Uh, Miss Cackle is, is the absent-minded and she has these 
statement glasses that she wears that are very distinctive to her, right? like Dumbledore's half-moon glasses, and she's very, like, she approaches the children with, instead of, why are you here? You're in trouble. Kind of more of a, how can we learn from this? How can we, very gentle approach, which Dumbledore has in the early books, obviously not in the later books. Um, but it feels like Miss Cackle was the outline for Dumbledore in ways that I can't even explain. Pro I feel like I can't even explain properly that y y you've just got to read the books. They're short. Yeah, there's seven of them, but they're real short. They're real, real short. You can get the whole series for like, I don't know, 10 bucks. I'll leave an affiliate link to the, to the listing on Amazon down below in the description. Um, and then she has our best friend, Maud, who is loyal to a fault. Maud is Ron Weasley. Maud is made fun of for the way she looks, and she clearly doesn't come from a very classy or high highbrow family, and she's a Weasley. She doesn't have umpteen brothers and sisters, or uh, rather umpteen sisters at the academy that everyone's comparing her to, yes. But I've read some interesting essays on how that is anti-Catholic propaganda, because the Weasleys are redheaded, and you find redheads in Ireland, which parts of Ireland are very Catholic, and there's so many children, and it's just, the whole thing, the more I look into, because I'm obsessed with author process and author's purpose, like, I, I when I read something, especially if in the moment I think it's good, I want to dissect it, and I, essentially, I want to ruin it for myself. And the Harry Potter series, first of all, I can't separate the work from the author. I just can't. Um, I was a very proud Ravenclaw. I had the wallet, I've got the shirts, I've got the sweater, I've got the skirt, I've got, I had the knee socks and the underwear that said Ravenclaw on them. Like, and I just can't separate the author from the work. As someone who is queer, as someone who is trans non-binary, as someone who is fat, all of the things that J.K. Rowling doesn't like, and before you get after me, that being fat isn't something in the book that J.K. Rowling rallies against, we have two characters that are fat that are portrayed in a good light, and even one of those isn't really, because that's Slughorn. We have Molly Reasley, who's described as plumped, who's described as plump, and Slughorn. Everyone else who is heavy and described as being heavy is a villain. They, including Slughorn at some points in the book, and it's seen as either an identifier that you can tell they're a bad person because they're fat. Like before Dolores Umbridge ever even speaks, they call her fat and toad-like, which, okay, that's a disgusting way to describe a human being. And it's meant to virtue signal that she's a bad person because she's fat. And you have Crab and Goyle who are fat and dumb. And the fat and the dumb are married to each other in that. And every character, there are other characters, I'm not going to get into all of them because we'll be here for 15 years, are, that are heavier, that it's a shorthand for calling them evil. It's a repercussion of them being evil, that they're gluttonous. Or it's a marker for them being stupid. Hagrid is large. He may not be f described as fat, but he's definitely described as large. And every time his size is mentioned, he's doing something stupid. Every time. So there's that. And then there's the antagonist teacher, Miss Hardbroom, which you have the teacher that hates the main character for really no reason and is a hard ass towards everyone, doesn't like anybody except their star pupil. And even then, when their star pupil really messes up, they don't like them either. They take all of their personal vendettas out on the children and are seemingly rewarded for that. So we've, we've got our Snape character. Like, the first book, there's, there's not to spoil it, it's a book from 1974. It's, it's an older book. But there's a plot that our heroine discovers that uh, Mildred, Mildred Hubble discovers and she, she's the one who saves the school. Yay, classes are canceled. We don't have to take exams. I'm like, I, I went to school. I, I went for, for uh, K 
kindergarten through 12th grade and then I put in four years of college. At no point was any, any anything a reason to cancel exams. I don't know if that's an American thing or if that's a not being fictional thing, but like I had a friend in high school whose father passed out while they were flying the plane and he landed the plane safely. I, there was a classmate who stopped a house fire and like contained it until firefighters like there were acts of bravery but we still had to take our finals because it's school and that's what school is that's just the first book that's just the similarities in the first book and then we have the second book which introduces another friend and this friend is bold and impulsive and wants to do th this essentially in the second book they introduce harry and we've got that kind of butting heads between the old friend and the new friend and the popularity and like all that nonsense like covering for your friend when you really should, probably shouldn't cover for them because they haven't done anything to deserve you covering for them but you're loyal to a fault and that's that's your character tm that's the second book and then it, it just goes on from there and while they are very very similar the worst witch books are better in in a couple of ways um sorry i'm scrolling i've got my my notes on my computer this time um, they're, they're better in some ways in that they're consistently for the same audience. Meaning, like, say I, I, actually, I have a family member who is a child who was reading Harry Potter and his parents, very rightly so, said you cannot read past this book because you're just not old enough and mature enough to read past this book. And it was frustration and consternation on the part of the child and it was, like, it didn't make the parents happy, it didn't make the kid happy because they chose because J.K. Rowling chose to make each book a different grade level, which any kid who reads, once they find out what they the book they like is a series, they're gonna read all of it. Um, series of Unfortunate Events, Lemony Snicket is a little bit of a problematic author, um, but all of the books are consistently on the same grade level. So if you come into the series later, you can keep reading them. There's nothing wrong with reading back a grade level. They don't have to age up with the kid. Like, that's that's a gimmick. That's a silly gimmick, I think. Like, if you're going to write children's books, write children's books. If you're going to write books for adults, write books for adults. Like, don't jump, jump from one age group to the next, to the next, to the next with each subsequent book. It's especially when you're not that good an author. I read Rowling's other stuff, the Gilbreth stuff, and it's not good. Like, I wanted to like it. I read Casual Vacancy. I, re I read the the crime, crime noir novels that she wrote under the pen name, and they're, they're not good. They're just not good. Like, with Casual Vacancy, there is a shock that there was such language from the writer of Harry Potter. And once that wore off, and I tried to read the book a second time, I'm like, oh, this sucks. Got it. Like, it's shock and awe, but once you get past the initial shock of sex, drugs, and language, it's telegraphed, it's it's just not good. It's not good writing, and it's I, I think it's, it's a problem. Anyway, the worst witch books, like, I, I've had from other people that, well, maybe she just missed the books because she was the wrong age group when the books came out. The books came out, the first one came out in 1974. The last one came out in, let me see, 2018, um, shortly before the book, the author died, 2013, um, 2007, 2005, 1993, 1982, 1980, like there were a lot of books written before Harry Potter came out, and the author kept writing, and consistently stayed at the same reading level, which is important because you're writing for children. If a child is enamored by a book, they want more. Give them more. The whole point in being a children's book writer is getting kids to read. If you write something that they're hooked on and then make the next one where they can't grasp it either subject matter wise or maturity level wise or their parents just won't let them because it involves characters literally being tortured and murdered because that's, that's great for children. It, it's it, it's a problem, and it's something that's that's bothered me since Harry Potter came out. Like, I I am part of the Harry Potter generation. Like, we didn't have a good bookstore where I grew up, so I didn't get to go to any of the midnight releases and be part of that. 
But I remember when the books came out and being excited and reading them over Christmas break and then a new one comes out and I spend Christmas break or Thanksgiving break or summer break or whatever reading all the books up until that one again. Like, I took a break after the Wizard Angst edition. Y'all know what I'm talking about there. Like, I just couldn't stand how angsty he got. Which, if they were written at a consistent grade level, there would have been less Wizard Angst and I would have kept reading the books. So, honestly, for me at least, it made me stop reading because they kept jumping, not in writing complexity, but in character complexity. And I'm like, I just, I'm going through that. Harry Potter and I, I'm the same age as Daniel Radcliffe, right? And, like, the books and the movies came out close enough to each other that, yeah, it's the same age. I, I was going through my own teen angst at the time that wizard angst came out, and I'm like, I just can't, I don't want to read this. I want to read about someone who's strong and capable and does things, and being angsty where if they had tried, you know, communication, it would have solved a lot of problems. Additionally, for the Worst Witch series in 1986, the first uh, the first book in the se series was com was converted to a made-for-TV movie with Tim Curry and Diana Rigg. Yes, that Diana Rigg from the Avengers TV show. Which, if you haven't seen the Avengers, please go watch the Avengers. It's brilliant. Uh, she was also on Game of Thrones, um, but Tim Curry, Diana Rigg, absolutely amazing. Um, also, one of the girls from the craft was in it. it it was on the in the USA. It aired on HBO, and it went through the whole book. Um, there was also a TV series between 1998 and 2001, going over the books that had been released at that time, with uh, Felicity Jones. She was in Northanger Abbey. She was in The Amazing Spider-Man 2. She was in Like Crazy. She was in the Theory. Of, she that's that's where I know the name. Theory of Everything. She's Jane Hawking. Um, and then they had spin-offs for it. And there was a television series again in 2017 to 2020, and there was a stage adaptation. So again, the similarities are very, very close. And it's part of the, the boarding school genre um, of British boarding school. So Julie Murphy uh, died in 2021, August 18th of 2021. She was 72. She saw the similarities between her work and Rowling's. And rather than being flattered that someone took her work and expanded on it and made it better. She, you owe me like some sort of I was inspired by credit because Rowling has maintained, still maintains, that Harry Potter came to her whole and fully formed, that she wasn't inspired by anything, that it just popped into her brain because she's such a good writer. She was very clearly inspired by this. Yeah, J.K. Rowling was born in 1965, which would put her at about nine years old, nine, ten years old, when the first book came out. So she was in the target age range for the books. And since they were such a runaway hit, she either grew up reading them or surrounded by friends who read them. So there's that. And Jill Murphy, I think I misspoke and called her Julie Murphy earlier. That's another author who's amazing. Uh, Jill Murphy, you could at least say that I was in a point of inspiration because I was. And it just, it, it bothers me. Like, I, I myself am a writer. I've published three books. I'm working on new projects right now. If someone reads something and they're like, hey, this kind of reminded me of this thing over here. I'll be like, oh, yeah, I was inspired by that. And I'll, you know, own up to it. Or I'll say, oh, I wasn't, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that before. But something that was on my mind was this over here. Because no one writes in a vacuum. Every writer, every artist pulls from the people who came before them. That's just how it works. And to to say that you're, you've never been inspired by someone else, that you've never, it, it's just... It's hubris, it's bullshit, and it's a lie. And it's just, it's, I wouldn't go so far as to say that Harry Potter rips off the worst witch, because it, it uses it as a springboard. But I can see where people would say that, especially because of Rowling's actions and the way she's adamantly said, no, this is entirely my own creation. Nobody else, no one ever else has ever done it. And 
like, you may think that I'm exaggerating, but I'm, I'm actually pulling from my notes. They're right here on my screen. From things she said in interviews when confronted by this. It bothers me. Like, it doesn't... If she had acknowledged or just said nothing, it would have been better than adamantly denying it. When it's quite clearly an inspiration. It's like A Kid in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain. He was clearly inspired by the Arthurian legends, right? He admitted that. He's like, yeah, I was inspired by this and that and this other thing. And I just, he admitted to cobbling together ideas to write books. He's, one, he's the great American author. Shakespeare and Marlowe copied each other, copied the Greeks, copied everybody, and weren't shy about it. Like, have some class and admit when you've been inspired by something. Because, especially if you're a children's author, all that's going to do is make the kids say, Oh, these books are, are similar to another book series? Let me go find that book series. It's, it's going to make children read more. My, my final thought is I think Rowling at some point bought into her own hype and decided and forgot what the author's purpose is. For a children's author, the author's purpose is to get the kids to read. It's to entertain them, it's to beguile them, it's to educate them into reading. And by say, saying, no, there's never been a book like it before and there never will be again. Again, not a direct quote, but I'm pulling from things she's said. It's frustrating. And it's, it's an outright lie. Um, Jill Murphy, again, her books are really well written. I'm in my 30s and I had a good time reading them even though they're written for like a 10 year old. They're well written, they're engaging, they're very visual. They're short, yes, because they're written, you know, for a 10 year old, but they're well written and a well written book is always worth reading. Should you read it? The Worst Witch series? I give it five of five stars. Definitely should be on your list. Give it a shot. See what you think. Have you read both? Have you read one or the other? What are your thoughts? And not just your thoughts on the book, but your thoughts on the authors, too. Let me know down in the comments below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!